Amen. Amen. This morning we're going to talk about this issue of hope. We're going to talk about hope. We each have our own story, so we each have our own level of hope that we're trying to, I won't say accomplish, but it's true, right? We all have our own stories. Good stories, bad stories, things that have happened to us, things that other people did that are now affecting us. We all have our own stories. And in our own stories, there are things that happen that are disruptions, unplanned events that have all taken place in our lives. Whether we're 12 and our parents decided to move, unplanned event. Right? Or you got water in your house this last week. An unplanned event. And in the middle of this, we try to figure out how we're going to navigate these lives for us. Because deep down, everybody is trying to figure out how to live what sometimes we would call the good life. How do we just live the good life? We all want to live the good life. We all want to have the best summer ever. It all comes from our hope. And it was this idea even last week and the last couple of weeks as we walked through this, the start of the book of Revelation is I really asked last week, I said this question, I said, what's your guide for your life? Everybody has one. What's the guide that is directing and guiding your life? Romans chapter 15, verse 13 says this about hope and what he wants for our lives, me and you. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God wants us to overflow with hope. And the only way that it does is when we put our faith and trust in him. But here's what's interesting. Here's how I know Christians struggle with this. If you would walk around Baraboo, or the Dells, or Portage, or anywhere, and ask, is this, what are, is this hope? How Christians is how you categorize a Christian, full of hope. People outside the church is not how we would be categorized by. It's not how people would look at Christians and be like, yeah, those that person, I know they go to church, I know they're a Christian, dude, they're so full of hope. That's not how we would categorize it as. So why is that? So many times Christians, we act out of fear, anger, stress, and it just isn't the way it should be. So what are we doing? Why, why is it that our attitudes, our mentalities, and how Scripture tells us to function are not the same thing? We don't have hope. Just look at it on social media. Seriously. Look at Christian people's social media pages. It's so depressing sometimes. It's like, man, I think one of the best things we could do is maybe just like scrub it, like clean because it's not everyone's mad. I never thought a city could get so worked up over concrete. Just saying. Like, I mean, right? It was like, all oh, hell broke loose over concrete. You're like, chill. Chill. But we blame a lot of other things. We still want to live the good life, but we let a lot, a lot of other disruptions affect our lives. Here's what I found interesting. So a couple weeks ago, I had the great opportunity I still call it a great opportunity. I'm trying to talk myself into doing, doing it again. I was going to teen camp. But at teen camp, most of the people that are there, I'll be completely honest with you, I was old, are college-age kids. College-age kids. And college-age kids approach life differently than us middle-aged adults do. I don't know if you realize this. They're full of hope, ambition, excitement. They're going to take over the world. I worked with somebody every day. This young lady is going, I think it's Bangladesh. She's got proof. She's a missionary going to Bangladesh with Project Rescue, which is an organization that pulls young men and women out of human trafficking to start a center for Project Rescue in Bangladesh because there is none. There is no houses. There is no port. Like They can't pull young men and women out because there's nowhere to put them. Here's a single 21-year-old that says, I'm going to pick up my life and I'm going to go to Bangladesh to start this home. I was like, good for you. Watch it. I'm like, <laughs> we're old and grumpy and complaining that there isn't the right kind of coffee. You're right? And she is like, going to Bangladesh to start up. Like, you know, I'm like, that's awesome. They're full of hope. They're full of excitement. So what happens? Let's be really honest here. Well, what happens at the time you are We'll just say 20 to 40. 
And somewhere along those lines, we become really grumpy and really angry. <laughs> Life happens. Our stories are added to by disruptions. By disruptions. Parenthood takes place. It changes things. We have moves that take place. It changes things. Health issues, career changes, everything changes from those times. Good things and negative things take place. Our stories are added to by disruptions. I think a lot of times we think of disruptions as a negative thing that happens to our lives. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Most of you guys, a lot of you guys know our story. Our oldest daughter, she's, her name is Ruby. She's in, actually in the nursery with my wife. We got pregnant with her before we were married. And so her and Jack this week dipped. They drove to Grandma's. They ditched us on the 4th. And they said it was hilarious. They go, they finally talked about it all, blah, blah, blah. And disruptions take place in, in our lives. We didn't plan for it, but I would never take it back. I'd do it all over again. Like, you would absolutely. Why? Because why would I ever take away my 16-year-old daughter? But it's a disruption. Things take place. Personal levels, things take place. Community levels, things take place, right? Concrete gets put in places and all hell breaks loose. One tiny little disruption and the whole city freaks out. It's not even a big deal. It's not like a tornado ripped through and tore off. Like That would be a big deal. A tornado hits, the schools are destroyed. Big time disruption. That's a big deal, right? We have a church, group of churches that we're associated with. Their church was destroyed in the tornado in Janesville a couple weeks ago. They can't have services. Why? Disruptions. Life is full of unplanned events. There's a term for this. It is called identity reintegration. What it means is this is how we handle these disruptions in our lives. It's a, it's a real psychological term. It's a real thing. How we are handling these disruptions in our lives, these unplanned events. How do we stay focused on a God that wants us to overflow with hope and joy when all these unplanned events keep happening? Well, Christianity isn't a religion. It's a relationship. And in the middle of this relationship, God calls us to do really crazy, extreme things. Right, I think sometimes we think that Jesus was just nice and everybody liked him. No, man, he said insane off-the-wall things. He had a standard that people look at, and you know, there is no way on human earth, we can ever meet that standard. And it's true. One of the biggest things that he said is a, this issue on forgiveness. Issue of forgiveness. Uh, and one of the craziest stories happens in Matthew chapter 18. And I'm just going to read the first couple verses, and then I'll paraphrase the rest of it. But the whole story is, uh, the whole story goes like the next like 10 verses. So you can write it down, look at it, all the way through verse 35. But here's what it says about this story. I'll paraphrase a lot of it. It says, Peter came to Jesus and asked, which is a good thing. Should all, hey, Jesus, what about this? All right. Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother and sister who sins against me? Seven. By the way, like this is talking about like on a daily. Right? So if you have somebody who did the same thing to you every single day, and you're like, I'm supposed to forgive this dude seven times a day? To me, I'm like, that's pretty good. I don't want to forgive somebody once. <laughs> let alone seven times in one day, right? And if you're more spiritual than me, that's awesome. We'll meet after service and you can help me out. <laughs> Here's what he says. He said, up to seven times? Jesus answered, Pfft. I don't know if he did that, but it seems like he did. He goes, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. And they went on to tell the story about a king, but a servant come to him. He goes, I need more time to settle my debts. I owed you a whole Owed you a million bucks. I don't know the exact amount. He goes, I owe you a million dollars. I don't have it. The people who owe me haven't paid me, so I can't pay you. He's like, I need more time. And the king goes, slate's wiped clean. Completely forgiven. So this guy turns around. He's like the middleman. He turns around, and all the guys that who owe him money, they said the same thing. They're like, hey, I can't pay. I need more time. And he goes off on them and rips them apart and does all this stuff to them. The king finds out that he had zero grace and zero mercy on the guy who owed him money. Then he dropped the hammer down and goes, how dare you? How dare you? He's like, this is what it's like when you don't forgive other people. Read the whole story. It's crazy. So think about this. Let's just go back to the beginning. Forgiveness. 24 hours in a day. We say we sleep eight. That leaves us 16 hours. Seven times a day. That's like, two hours. That's like tw every two hours. 
every two hours, you're supposed to give somebody, forgive somebody about the same thing every day for the rest of your life. That's the standard that Jesus has set. You're like, yo, not happening. Like, let's just be really honest. I'm a parent. I got kids. You know what I make them do? The dishes once in a while. And I mean the dishes. I mean unload and load the dishwasher and wipe down the counters. Okay? And yeah, once in a while it's like a pot or pan. It's not like it's extreme. You know how frustrated I would be? If every two hours I told them to load the, like, unload and load the dishwasher and they never did it. Every day. All day long. At some point, after about the second time, I'm like, hold up. Remote, remote, remote. Phone, phone, phone. Get your butt, you know, like, right? Like, this is just what we would do. This is what we would do. I know friends and spouses, like, that won't talk to each other for days. You took my sandals. <laughs> days. Spouses won't talk to each other for days. I can't believe they spent that money. Right? Days. People won't talk to each other. And God says, dude, and his idea was every two hours. And Jesus is like, two hours? Heck no. He goes, 70 times seven. It's like, that's 490 times a day. That's every couple minutes. The same thing. Which tells us this, is this idea that we have to constantly be letting go of the disruptions that take place in our life. I don't like that. <laughs> Here's what we have to understand. The harbored unforgiveness will keep us from having the hope that God wants us to have. Harbored unforgiveness will keep us from having hope. Period. We just use other words for it. Say, I have hope. I don't have any unforgiveness. Got any resentment? Any disappointment? A little jaded? You ever get triggered? <laughs> Frustrated? Angry? We just use other words to make ourselves feel better about our own conditions of our lives. See, if I, if I was that mean, I could put up situations in your life that make you squirm. A video of a past event, a picture of something, you'd just be like, you know, I don't really know about that. I don't really, ah, uh, those, I don't like teachers, why? Because the teacher, you know, you, ever, you know, if you, old school, I don't know if Catholic schools still do this, right? The old school theory, you know, the big, thick ruler slapping the kids on the hand, all that kind of stuff, right? If that was your childhood, guess what? You don't like teachers. You're like, oh, those teachers. Why? Because that's your memory. That's your memory. You get real uneasy. I had a, a therapist tell me this. It says, resentment is unforgiveness, just charging interest. It's like, gosh dang it. <laughs> I built up a lot of interest in my life. Right? Resentment is just unforgiveness that is charging interest. And here's what we try to do. We say, oh, I don't have any resentment. I'm not trying to pray for God to strike anybody down dead. No, we just push it down. Pretend it's not impacting you. You know what we do? We just push people out of our lives. We say things like, ah, oh, that relationship is just kind of toxic, so we're not going to be friends anymore. And what we do is we take the binocular view instead of the mirror view, and it's always about somebody else rather than about the stuff that we have to work on. And it may be a bad relationship, and it may not be for you, but there's always something that we can pull from to get figured out in our own lives. We like to put Band-Aids on wounds that need surgery to happen for them. And if we're honest, there's stories being played out in our lives that are manifesting ways that we just have to realize that we have unforgiveness in our lives. We just tell ourselves our stories to make ourselves feel good rather than being honest. Forgiving somebody 490 times a day, we go, that's just excessive. You know, that's an order from God. But here's what stinks. It's not an order for you and not for me. <laughs> it's an order for me and for us. I like it. I would rather have the Bible say it for everybody else, but not the person preaching it. <laughs> Just being honest with you guys, like, right? Like, it's, 
And that's the same way for everything, right? It's a lot easier to give somebody else advice about something than it is for you to follow your own advice. It just is. You have to develop healthy habits and everything else. It's not excessive. It's not excessive to forgive that many times over and over and over again. It's an order and a demand from God. There's, a, there's another story in the Bible, and it's the Bible's story. It's called the parable of the sower. I like to call it the story of disappointment. And here's why. Let me tell you, if you've never heard the story, I'll just break down the story. There was this farmer, and he was sowing seeds, right? They'd walk around these big packs of seeds, and they would just scatter seed. Scatter seed, gas, scatter seed. We're a little smarter now, and we got rows, we figure it all out. He was scattering seed. I remember growing up hearing the story all the time. It was always about Christians telling other people about the gospel, and some are going to hear it, and some are not. And it's still true, but I think there's a lot of things, that we, lessons we can learn from this story. And the first one was just hard ground. It's like this. You just throw it on carpet, throw it on concrete. It's never going to last. You can throw it out there and birds are going to come and eat it. Like some people, no matter the best advice you give them, it doesn't matter what you say. They're just like, okay. And they're never going to listen. Ever. The second one is the, as you scatter in dirt and rocks. And, and it grows a little bit, but pretty soon there's just not enough healthy stuff for the plants to grow and it gets choked out. And these are people who real quick, the, the, the seed, for us it's weeds, go real quick, right? And then it just gets choked out. People get real excited. Yeah, Jesus is awesome. The gym is awesome. And they're there for two weeks and then they're done. And you're like, yeah. July 15th rolled around and all of their goals for the year are over. You know, it's like, ah, I missed the day. It's done. Right? It's just passion and excitement, but nothing to keep it going. The third one, the third one, it's a little bit better, but this time the weeds, it's just what happens is, is you plant everything, everything's growing just fine, but you never prune the weeds, you never pull anything out. You never change the systems and habits in your life, and you just eventually, it all gets choked out, right? If, if you've got a garden and you never plant anything, eventually these weeds are going to overtake your tomatoes. You've got to pull weeds, you've got to change the systems in your life. That's the third one. And the fourth one, finally, he sows it in good dirt. And he spreads it. He gets 30, 60, 100 times fold in return. And it is an awesome harvest. He's like, that's awesome. In reality, this is just a story about disappointment. It's a story about disappointment. That if you ever find yourself in a position of leadership, that three out of four people are just never going to want to hear your advice. Three out of four people really just actually don't want to improve their life. They really don't. Sure they do. No, they don't. Because they're not actually willing to do the things it takes to change. They want the change. They want the experience. But they don't want to actually set the systems and rhythms in place to see those things take place. Yes, biblically speaking, Christianity and your relationship with Jesus and outside of it too. And being in leadership positions, this is why you realize, you're like, yeah, that, that is absolutely true. That's why leadership is like the most, you know, a lonely thing you can do. But it's one of the most interesting things too, right? Because if you're not in it, you want the power, you want the authority to be like, yeah, I can run this. And then you get in that position and you're like, forget that. I don't want to do any of this. Because you realize that you're the one that's always pushing somebody. Always. This is your job. This is your role. I understand my job and my role is to push you towards Christ, and I understand that three out of four people eventually just flake out and leave. Look at numbers for gyms. Go like if Planet Fitness ever showed their or okay, not we won't you know if Snap Fitness because we have any time right okay right if Snap Fitness shared like their numbers of how many people sign up compared to how many people actually go, it's probably even more than seventy five percent never show up on a monthly basis. Why? Because they don't, they'll sign up for the gym. Yay! $10 a month. Sweet! Because they don't actually set the rhythms in place. And they understand it. it's actually the business principle. It just gives as many people as humanly possible. Because they know what actually takes place. It's hard pouring into people's lives. There's going to be three times more disappointment when you're trying to help people than there ever will be for a reward. There's three times more disappointment in your own personal life than there ever will be for the rewards because it's 
hard and life happens. And sometimes their kids just don't listen. Sometimes they will for a little bit, and then they won't again. Sometimes they'll do it for a little bit longer, and then they won't. And there's just these ebbs and flows in these seasons of life, and you're like, I seriously have to explain how to do this again? Like, I know you know how. Seventy times seven. Jesus, I believe, was teaching Peter and all leaders In order to honestly reap the rewards of life, you're going to have to learn to forgive 70 times 7. That would have been a much better title, 70 times 7. I just realized that. Things that go through my head in the middle of speaking. But here's what actually stinks. You ready for this? We do this to our own self. We probably fail our own selves 75% of the time too. Three out of four situations, like, ah. Three out of four days, you wish you would have gone to the gym. Three out of four days, you wish you would have handled your kids differently and you didn't. Three out of four times, you wish you would have spoke to your boss differently and you didn't. Three out of four ways, you how you wish you would have saved and you didn't. We disappoint ourselves. How do we forgive? How do we forgive? A Harvard study did a study on this because how do people forgive? Like the big stuff, right? Um, drunk driving accident, the drunk driver kills their family, they live, whatever. Big thing. If that's you, sorry, I'm just in my. Um, that's a big deal. Big deal. How do you forgive? It's not in the moment, it's learning throughout the seasons of life to forgive yourself and to forgive all the little stuff over and over and over and over again. So how do you know if you're actually doing this? Well, you ever find yourself getting mad at silly things? You ever find yourself being greedy about stuff? Like you don't want your kid to eat your yogurt? It's my yogurt, I bought it for myself. I'm just trying to teach them respect for other people's stuff. It's a 68 cent container of yogurt that now you just started an argument. At some point, someone ate something of yours, took something of yours. You never forgive me. You let the resentment build and build and build and build and build. Where now, every time someone opens the fridge, it's like, that's my food. Unforgiveness coming out in a way that we don't like. I don't know, that's bad. There's something there years ago that took place that is built up and now it's just coming out. If we're going to live with the hope that God wants us to live with, forgiveness has to become second nature into our lives. And the reason why we see so many people, the reason why you see so many people lose their ever loving minds over concrete barriers was because there was stuff that happened in their lives that they never let go of. There was a whole bunch of resentment and unforgiveness and bitterness and anger in their life, and it was just coming out on everybody else. Because it was just concrete. But you don't understand. If this person would just take my advice, it's really good, and just listen to me. Mm -hmm. I know. Here's another way. You ever, uh, If you're in the business of helping people or kids or whatever, You ever see people as a problem to be fixed or a project to be handled? So you can't actually help people if they're just problems and projects. I know, I do it too. I preach it myself. It's fine. Do it every week. Seriously, I do. Multiple times. You can't. See, the story of the sower, I always took it as I was the guy sowing good seed. And a part of it, you can use this story that way. We're sowing the gospel, we're sowing good seed. But I think more than anything, we have to look at ourselves as we're one of the types of soil. We're the one of the types of soil, or dirt, or ground. Because the Bible is never to be used as binoculars, it's to be used as a mirror point at ourselves before we ever point at anybody else. You know, we go back to that story. The king forgave one of his servants 
the servant didn't repay the favor to one of his own. If we are going to, you know, God's forgiven us. We better repay the favor and forgive other people. And what the stories combining them are trying to tell us is like, Jesus is like, do you have any idea the things I forgive you for every day? Every day? Yeah, I'm probably forgiving you 490 times a day. You can't even get your coffee before God's like, you better start forgiving people. The same thing. Like, come on, we've all done that one. Just let me drink coffee first, and I can deal with whatever happened on the Xbox. Right? Like, how about I just throw it away? Then I want to deal with it. Right? Like, whatever. I'm not answering that email from work. I didn't get my coffee yet. Are you serious? They called in again, whatever it is. And what happens is we have these type of thoughts. I'm only in this mess. I'm only in this situation. I'm only broke because my boss didn't give me the promotion. I'm only in this mess because my spouse wouldn't change. My kids are only this bad because of the school district. We look at everything else rather than pointing things at ourselves. We look at all the disappointments. Marriages that didn't work out, business plans that went belly up, churches who didn't help me enough, pastors who weren't funny enough, kids who got in the way of my dreams. Oh, now I'm getting deep. We have to forgive and let go of all the people, places, the organizations that have played a part in our story. Good things and bad things, because there's disruptions that will constantly take place in our life. Always. Disruptions that will always take place. And then and only then will we have real lasting hope. And here's the deal. You only really know by your actions moving forward. Right? You really only know, like, you can write it in a journal, you can say it out loud, you can go to somebody and apologize, you can do all these sorts of things, but you really only know it until it actually comes about. Because I, but I can tell you this, forgiveness will bring good soil, and good soil will produce a harvest of hope. And hope is contagious. If you want to know whether or not this is really working out in your life, do people want to be in your own house? Right? Like, do people want to be around you? Or people like, dude, I just can't. Parents, do your kids want to be in your own house? I'll look down, not to look at anybody. Do your kids' as friends want to be in your house? Because if they're like, get me out of here, guess what? There is an environment that is not hopeful, that is not joyful, and is not peaceful. And most likely, as an adult, we're the one that sets the tone, which means we got a lot of bitterness and unforgiveness that we got to get out so we can create that atmosphere in our house. Sorry. Not, not really. I don't care anymore. Um, because hope is visible. Hope is visible. People will see it. People will see it. You see, I think one of the things that happens in life is, you know, people always talk about these spiritual battles and things that take place. It's like, oh, the devil's not attacking me. No, the devil doesn't need to attack you. He just needs to destroy our hope. Disruptions are always going to happen. It's just the ebbs and flows of life. He's like, yeah, you're never going to quit, but I'll just destroy all the hope and joy that you have in your life. He's winning way too many people's battles for hope. Simply because we do want to be honest with our own lives and take a look at the mirror and the unforgiveness that we are holding on to. Listen, nobody's exempt from this, guys. That's why there's stories in the Bible to help us get through it. Ah, it was a month or two ago. I was sitting in my office and my trusted advisor, helper, confidant came in, which I thought was like, Oh, 15-minute meeting turned into three hours. And as we're sitting and chatting, bringing stuff up, it's like crap, more crap cave cups are coming up. And what you realized, what I realized, it was, it was for me. It was all about me. I was, been, I was going to this person. It's like there was stuff that people did to other people in my life before I even met them that I was still pissed off about. I was like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was years ago. It didn't even happen. It happened before I even met people. But it was like, but because of somebody else's actions, it was impacting the people 
in my own life, which is then taking me off. And so we had our own little intervention. We cried and prayed. We did all the things that guys aren't supposed to do. Hug, cry, pray, because we're men. We did it multiple times too. I know. But this is what happens when disruptions take place and things happen in our lives. Because things happen to your life and things will continue to happen to your life. All right, uh, our boys, we live over on like Madison, Iroquois area. And they've got a kid in there that goes to the park all the time with them. This kid is from Kazakhstan. And his parents left because his dad was about to get rushed into the military because of all the mess with, the, with Russia and Ukraine. He spent thousands of dollars to get his family here. Disruption. He had nothing to do with two psycho governments just angry at each other. And he moves to Baraboo, Wisconsin. And now my boys are like, it's crazy, this stuff he says. I'm like, that's awesome, dude. Become friends with him. That is the coolest thing ever. I'm like, can they come over? I just want to hear stories. <laughs> I'm kind of curious, you know what I mean? Like, disruptions happen. And they will continue to happen. But God wants to bless his people. He wants us to be the last of that soil, the good soil, where he can bless us 30, 60, 100 times fold. But we have to be good soil. And good soil is only full of hope. Full of hope in your marriages, full of hope in your relationships, full of hope in your businesses and your kids and your school and our country and our city and our church. Full of hope is God, because God said he's the God of hope. God said he's the God of hope. I didn't say it. I didn't come up with any of this. That's what's so great about Scripture. I don't have to come up with anything. So as we end and we're almost done, let me ask you these two questions. And every week, if you're newer, try to do these take-homes. Because honestly, here's my thing. I'm not with you the rest of the week. I'm not your babysitter. You don't deserve that. You're an adult. You don't deserve a babysitter. But I honestly believe this. If everybody showed up every week, or even listened online, and you took the 52, we'll say 50 because it's an even number. If you took the 50 things home, these questions are really dove into them and changed the things that we said we need to change, your life would absolutely look 100% different in one year. In one year. So if it's not, maybe something's got to change. Your take home is this. I've got two questions for you. What is your level of hope? And what do you need to, or who do you need to forgive so that you can have hope? Where's your hope at? How hopeful are you? It is the summer of 2024. Do you really want to look back on next July 4th just as angry if there's more barricades up? What a horrible life to live. You really want to go into this next school year just waiting for something negative to happen again? Oh, I can't wait. That teacher's going to say something I don't like. Get over it. You say stuff you don't like. I'll say stuff that you don't like. Like, where's your level of hope? And then who do you need to forgive so you can actually have it? Who do you really need to be honest about? You don't want to tell people. You don't want to say, I haven't held on to that for 38 years. Really? I can't believe my dad did this when I was 12. Yeah, it's hard. But it might be really needed. If my boss just... If those people would just listen... Been there. Done that. Walking through it. Just another human being that puts his shoes on just like you guys. But if we're going to have the hope that was described in Romans 15, overflowing with hope, these are things that we need to deal with. Because that's what God wants for your life. What's your level of hope? How are you navigating disruptions? <laughs> How are you navigating disruptions? Because they're going to happen, good ones and bad ones. Dude, I got a sophomore in high school, about to be a junior. We did a college visit. Oh, my gosh. I still feel like I'm in college. I still kind of want to be in college, you know what I mean? Like, let's go. Oh. It's going to happen. She's going to leave, and I'm going to cry, and I'm going to throw a fit. 
And one day she's going to get married, and I'm not going to like them. I hope I do. <laughs> you know, like, it just happens. We can't. We can't. We don't exist in bubbles. Man, I could go off. I'm not. There's not, disruptions are going to happen. How are you handling the disruptions of life is a really good teller where your soul is at. What's your level of hope? Who do you need to forgive? Let's pray. Lord, hope. Four letters. Four letters with such a big meaning. Lord, I know we are adults and we've all had disruptions and things to our lives. and Some more serious than others because we've all had them. And they're little, light night, they're little lights into our souls to see how we handle it. From maybe being greedy and really silly, dumb things that doesn't really matter. Like yogurt in our fridge. The things that happened to us in the past. Lord, I pray that you would give us all the courage because it is scary to do, a, to do a real deep dive into our souls so that we can be honest with ourselves and you can heal us so we can have be good soil, so we can overflow with hope, so that when we